I was born into a family um, in Nottinghamshire uh, in the 1940s. My father's family business was called the Butterley Company, which was engineering and coal mining in that East Midlands part, and my father was in charge of, of the mining element. And we were four boys. My mother had a bit of Australian in her, because her, her mother was born in Australia. My father had some Irish in him, so the, we're a little bit cosmopolitan, not pure English. My, both of my parents were Roman Catholic. We were brought up as, as, as Catholics. I was the third of four sons. All the four of us were educated at the Benedictine Monasteries School at Ampleforth in North Yorkshire, where my father had been educated and his brother had been educated and had become a monk. I was number three and then number four. Number three, I did a bit of rebellion and went and after school at Ampleforth became a, wanted to be a missionary in Africa. That lasted one year. I then thought I would become a monk and the abbot of the time said, no, Timothy, clear off, go away for a year. So I went to a university in, called Fribourg in Switzerland, did a year studying French and a little bit of philosophy, came back and joined the, joined the monastery. All four of us, one way or another, went to university. My own career was in reading geography at Oxford because my community had a house in Oxford and three of us, the monks, went to, through that house doing different, different courses. On return from Oxford, I then did a, a theology degree external from London University and then started teaching in our high school. And I taught geography, I taught a little bit of geology, I taught a little bit of religious studies. And as time passed, I gradually focused on religious studies and was very keen on developing it as an academic subject, not just a matter of form, formation and belief, but a matter of understanding what, what theology is about, what belief in God entails, the role of Christ from a Christian point of view, the role of the church. Towards the end of that, I started to get other responsibilities. I was a housemaster, Ampervoice divided into 10 houses, that is to say, the top five years of a student's course at Ampleforth would be done in a house basis. So there would be about 10 or 12 in each year. And I was housemaster of one of the 10 houses. And I did that for, from about 1980 to 1997. Oh, I had also run the theology department and I ended up by being deputy head. And then in 1997, to everyone's surprise, I was elected abbot, including my own, I have to add, of a community of some 90 plus monks at Ampleforth, of whom probably a third to a half were working on parishes away from the abbey. A good percentage were working in the abbey on our schools and in our retreat centre. And we had a number who were at Oxford and we just made a foundation in Zimbabwe. So this was a quite, quite a big step. I'd just been in the school. I hadn't been on a parish, I hadn't been in Zimbabwe. I'd been through Oxford, but I'd never taught there. So I was abbot then for, for eight years, which is the, the stint. During which time, I was sitting in my room as the abbot and one of our parish fathers rang up and said, um, Father Abbot, he was a contemporary of mine, so I knew him quite well. And he said, Father Abbot, I've got a young friend of mine here and I want to bring him to Amberforth. Oh, I said, yes, who is he? He's, he's a Muslim called Muhammad Ali Shamali, and he wants to visit Ampleforth. So I said, yeah, bring him over. So he came over. He at that time was studying in Manchester University doing his doctorate. And I said to him, would you mind coming and giving some talks to the monks? He said, yeah, of course. So I went and told the monks, I said, community, I said, we're having a, a couple of weeks time, we're going to have a a Shia Muslim from Iran talking to us, okay? They went, what? <laughs> anyway, I said to Mohammed, I said, Mohammed, 27 and a half minutes, not one second more. And he turned up and he spoke about the spirituality of, of Shia Islam. He had the community absolutely in his hand. And the most conservative of the monks at that time, he ceased died, but came up to me afterwards and he said, that was brilliant. 
Now that doesn't happen very often, I have to say, in a monastic community that they will say someone who comes in and gives a lecture, particularly from another faith. But from that, Mohammed and I developed a series of dialogues linked in with London University, uh, which went well. And we, we had two at Ampleforth and then one in Worth. And all that time we were sort of building our relationship. And all this time we were still doing these, these meetings. But the first three I ran, and then William Skudlarek, who was in charge of monastic interreligious dialogue, he took over. And he did the next three, one of which was in Rome, San Anselmo. The second was in Com, which was our first time in Com. And the third was in Assisi in Italy. He then said he'd done enough. And to put, to put a long story short, I then took it back on and ran the last one, which was last year in Com. My life has become to appreciate over the years the, the similarity and the difference. When I finished the PhD, the next step was I'd done seven years in Rome, that was enough, and I was offered a job teaching in a place called Benedictine University, which is just outside Chicago in the United States. And they have 27% of their students are Muslim. And so they asked me to come and teach. And when they, the, the head of religious studies came, he said, Timothy, will you teach the spirituality of the Abrahamic faiths? And I said, of course. And I said, where's the syllabus? Thinking that, he, he said, make it up yourself. Well, that was an absolute gift because I could create a syllabus that I wanted to do. And so the syllabus I created was basically trying to get each, the Muslim appreciate the Christian, the Christian appreciate the Muslim. And so what I did was, I first of all started with, I did it by weeks, by the the four aspects of the one God, which both Muslims and Christians have. So there's a God who created the world, a God who guides the world, a God who forgives sin, and a God who gives life after death. And both Christians and Muslims accept that framework. Different, yes, but nevertheless, the words are similar. But you're not saying we're the same, because we're not. We're different. But in our differences, our orientation is to the one God. And that, to me, is where the one God mysteriously is revealing both to Islam and to Christianity. Sadly, when you get onto the political world, of course, you have complete opposite. And that, that to me, is the real tragedy that we face. And part of the problem in the West is that because we have become what I would call loose about our religious faith and our religious belief, we're much more secular than we used to be. The sense of the, of the spirituality of the, two, of the two religions loses its power, except for those who, who really believe and are really interested. But it's, it's amazing, those classes that I had, when they did the reflection at the end, the students would say, I never realised. In other words, I never realised how close one is to the other. I always said, it's appreciating similarity and appreciating difference and knowing where the boundaries are, which is important. So that's, that's where I am at the moment. I'm teaching at the moment in another university, St. Martin's uh, uh, University near Seattle. I have one more year after this on my visa. And my hope is one day to be able to, to, to teach elsewhere, come back to London perhaps, and go and try and twist Mohammed's arm and, offer one or two courses for him, that sort of thing. Because I'm not trying to push, what I'm trying to do is to, I'm not pushing one is right and one is wrong. I'm absolutely not doing that. What I'm trying to say is we can only appreciate each other if we look at the spirituality. Politics are not the point. Economics are not the point. What is the point is the underlying spirituality, which is the revelation of the one God. And to me, that is the, the powerful avenue which believers, be they Muslim or be they Christian, should walk together, recognizing that difference is real, but also affirming the similarity, which builds the relationship. I suppose the image I would use is, instead of sailing down one, one river on the boat, we're on two sides of the bridge. 
crossing the river. That, and the ultimate answer to the question, well, who is true? My belief is that it, 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 God is such, that God is big enough to say both are. But the, and it's at that level of appreciation, which is why the conferences I've had with, with um, Mohammed in, in Calm and the, the way we relate and discuss matters of spirituality are so powerful and so important. Being really honest, you start by human relations, not by theology. And that's why I believe that schools need, I, I mean, I'm talking Muslim Christian. I'm not worried about this, Orthodox, Catholic, Anglican, whatever, but Muslim Christian. And because th what struck me in the Benedictine University was when they said at the end of the course, oh, so many of them, I never realized. And it's not that I'm teaching a, a highly academic subject. I'm giving them the text. And they see straight away that the story of Genesis occurs only once in the Old Testament. It occurs about eight times in the Holy Quran. And you see the subtle differences. But it's the same story. But the same story has different interpretations. But that builds, starts building the bridge. The average person, you say, who's done, never done any of that study, you said... Islam is your, is your brother, you know that, don't you? Absolutely not. And Muslims, absolute Christians, no, absolutely, because they don't know. Or what they know is pretty superficial. And they're lumbered with the whole of the Middle East problem, which is not a happy solution. Partly because the Western media, in my view, is completely corrupt. And until people really face up to the role of Israel, negative role of Israel, the whole thing is going to be a mess. But I don't want to go into that. Dr. Abu Timothy Wright, as Keshwar Engelstan, Shana Bai Dr. Shamali, Mudir Markaz Islamiy London, and Mudir Muassesi Beinul Melali Mutalat Islamiy. big mistake if you think it's only something between you and God. Your relation with God is very much shaped and formed by the way you relate to other creatures of God. And this is why in Islam we say loving God is not enough. You have to love for the sake of God, not just to love God. If you are able to love for the sake of God, then that's the achievement. Thank you very much for Akhirul Da'wana and Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alam.